Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with stalwarts of music. Today's episode is being partnered along with Perpetual Buzz Experiences, who are an artist representation company with three very basic but lofty goals. They are the launchpad for a lot of indie musicians, helping them leverage success by producing very memorable experiences and make sure the entire process is smooth. They have been supporting social causes for a long time now. Do check out www.perpetualbuzz.com for more information. We have yet another podcast partner, which is Wire Up Music Store, one of the finest music retail stores with state-of-the-art equipment. Your one-stop solution for musical gear, ranging all the way from guitars to percussive instruments. If you happen to be in Bangalore, do check out their store in Kormangla. And do check out their Instagram page, which goes by the handle at the rate wireup dot India. Speaking of my guest today, I'm talking to a very interesting lady, Tanya Callaghan, who's an established freelance musician, bassist, speaker, and an activist as well. So she's got a very eclectic and impressive career till date. She's been never afraid to take the leap of faith. Tanya's determination, passion, and talent began to pay off when she spread her wings internationally. She started out in Ireland during her initial days, and she's practically played with every popular musician out there. She stored, recorded, written, and worked with legends such as Maynard Keenan of Tool, Dee Snyder of Twisted Sister, Steven Adler of the popular Guns N' Roses. Nono Betancourt of Extreme, and last but not the least, David Coverdale of White Snake. She's one of the first and the very few artists who's made it really huge in the whole rock and roll and hair metal music space. Without any further ado, I'm delighted to welcome my guest for today, Tanya Callaghan. Hello. Hi, hi, Tanya. Hi, how are you? One second, I'm just getting everything open. There we go. Sure, sure. How are you? Where are you right now? Good. I'm in California. I just got back mm-hmm. from Europe. What's happening? What are, you, what are you up to these days? Well, I just came back off a four-month tour with Whitesnake all across Europe. So, and Wow, that's, that's a yeah. dream. That must have been a total dream. It was amazing. And I literally just got my gear back like yesterday because it, you know, it took a while to come back. But and then I came home and I got locked out of my social media. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's completely fine. But I hope you're not jet lagged. Are you, are you doing fine? Um, I'm not really because I, I honestly travel so much and have done for the past 10, 12 years that I'm just so used to it. I, I know how to deal with it. So, I mean, some mornings I need a little bit more coffee than others. But <laughs> <laughs> how about you? Uh, I'm doing fine. Uh, you know, I've been looking forward to this interview. And I have a couple of very interesting questions coming your way today. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Likewise. Uh, So let's get started with our agenda for today. Uh, Could you perhaps draw an analogy to the starting of your debut Whitesnake performance? Could you explain to us, how did you count down to that magical moment from the very first musical note that resonated for you? You mean upon joining? That's right. Yeah, well, the, the coolest part about the White Snake gig was, I don't know for your listeners, if they knew that the opening night of the tour was in Ireland, where I'm from. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so it was, you know, baptism by fire. My very, very <laughs> first show with White Snake was in my home country, and I hadn't been home in a couple of years. Okay. So it was, it was extra special. But, you know, we did... Um, we did like a week and a half or so rehearsals before that. And it was it was just amazing because, you know, I'm a, a session musician, a hired gun. So I'm so used to going in and out of lots of different bands over the years. But w- with the guys in White Snake, it immediately felt like a family. They're really, really cool people. I knew some of them. I didn't know some. So but it was like instantly we all bonded and gelled. And for me as the bass player to play with Tommy Aldridge on drums is just you know, incredible. So from that first beat, we were just locked in and it was like, all right, this is going to work well. <laughs> <laughs> incredible. I mean, it just gives me gooses when you 
when you say all of this because i've i've heard these guys seen them live uh, on these uh, on the dvds or or your uh, popular press but i've never had the chance to sort of see them live yet but yeah it'd yeah. be a, it'd be a total dream come true indeed yeah it was amazing so how did the environment receive you when you when you sort of migrated from ireland and you shifted to america for music was it was it a pleasant experience it was hard like um cuz i just took a leap of faith so i was you know i was busy in ireland doing my thing with a few different bands that were based either in like ireland uk or europe and i was you know sort of expanding my career over there but ireland mm-hmm. is such a small country that at a certain point i had i had done all of the the biggest gigs you could kind of do and i thought well I need to go further and I need to go bigger. So LA seemed like an obvious place um and I decided just to to take a total leap of faith and I went on my own with just me and my bass and said, you know, if I throw myself into this scene because like one thing I always say to people no matter what it is you're trying to do in life, music or not, you find people who are already doing that and then you go and you surround yourself with yeah. people who are already doing it. So for me it was jumping into a scene where it was side hired gun session musicians that play with big bands and just going to all these jam nights and and asking questions and trying to understand like how do you get these gigs and the reality is it only comes with playing so you have to be out playing people see you word of mouth recommendations bam 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 and yeah so I didn't know anyone the only thing that that helped me in America was I had Maynard Keenan from Tool on my CV because I had recorded with him a couple of years earlier okay. so going in not knowing anyone but being able to say here I recorded with a big American artist before was you know my little ticket of like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting but but was it was it always smooth but or, or did you have your fair share of uh, ups and downs Oh, it's never smooth. It's never smooth in the, in the music industry. I had uh especially the first year or two very tough because okay. um literally just trying to climb a ladder that you're the newbie in town and it's incredibly expensive to be in Los Angeles and yeah. you know, I have to get visas and it's it's so complicated like people have no idea. So what I was doing yeah. for for the first two or three years was coming back and forth because I couldn't be in the US. I was waiting to apply for visa. I was still working in my bands in Ireland and you know on different tours, saving up coming to the US to try to like meet new people every time, going back because I could only be there for 90 days and I couldn't work there yeah. and do it did this jump across like from Ireland to to LA quite a lot for about two years and then each trip you would meet someone else that would lead to another conversation that would lead to a studio session that would lead to so it took the first two or three years to really like sort of get known in the scene and then as soon as i landed like my first relatively big gig was in the pop realm then it mm-hmm. sort of just comes this spiral because your name is starting to get thrown around and recommended so once that happened it became a lot smoother i don't want to use that word though because it's still hard it's still the music mm-hmm. industry and it's you know it's ever changing but oh. yeah I, i did that and then it was like d snider steven adler white snake just all in a row did but you yeah. have an agency that sort of backed you up or was it was it a complete uh, you were just scouting out for all of this on your own no totally self managed totally self managed because it's yeah. uh it's an industry of of you know building relationships and building yeah. Yeah. these musical relationships and friendships with people that will recommend cuz i mean obviously it's important to be a solid and strong player but the more important part is like your your relationship and communication with the people yeah. that you're going to be working with so it's a lot of building up those relationships within the music scene yeah. and then you know people get along and they want to work with you and you want to work with them so no agent lots of la agents tried to manage me i was like no i'll manage me <laughs> but but it is it is a niche in itself not not everyone's capable of doing the manage management side of it as well as a music bit you know it's 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 a skill that only a few of them like you would probably be able to you know get with yeah you have to have your your wits about you because it's very yeah. you know, especially when you're new in a scene like that and you, you have to be careful because there's all there's also a lot of like dodgy people there's a lot of a lot of just yeah. waste time harmless but you know 
you just you got to be really good at saving out like yeah. which is is this good for me is this person a good connection you know is this person a good person um and I was I've always been good at that anyway um you just got to have your feelers on for like who are the good people and then you know you surround yourself with good people and it's cool. one of the most important things in life and then I was lucky to you know really get to know some of the real heavy hitters and top session players relatively early because I would just go to every gig so you show up at people's gigs so you're supporting them and they appreciate that because a lot of times people are very flaky and then they invite you to play and then it becomes this you know back and forth and it's yeah but it's uh it's, it's definitely not for the faint-hearted <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure it's, it's it's quite hard to sort of uh juggle between uh all the stuff that you do but let me stick take a step back right now i'm, I'm gonna sort of take you down memory lane uh, during <laughs> your youth i'm sure you would have experimented with different musical talents in terms of what you have what what is a special quality that the bass guitar had for you and what prompted you to get started with it and get going well i was very late to music actually um mm -hmm. i didn't start playing until i was 17 or 18 because i only worked with animal welfare i was a, a little okay. animal rights activist i still am oh wow and yeah yeah that's my first passion i've always mm -hmm. worked in space and music has given me a platform to, to to use my my voice in that space and the environment and animal welfare around yeah. but space came about was quite funny because i was working in an animal rescue shelter for 10 years and then Lovely. yeah <laughs> that's literally what i did everyone yeah. thought i would be deaf. i never played music yeah. ever um i sang in a choir like that was about it and then I did a little music course in my hometown um, mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to be a drummer for a minute. I got this idea in my head, but okay. I couldn't really afford a good drum kit. And, you know, it's hard to be a drummer yeah. when you don't have yeah. the space or the setup. Yeah. So I saw a local guy playing bass when I was like about, about 17 or so. And I never mm -hmm. thought of bass before that because okay. you, you think of the guitar, drums, more sort of prominent, obvious things. But he was playing really melodically yeah. and not you to hear just like rock root notes or whatever not that there's anything wrong with that it's half my career but, uh, um and i just fell in love with it and i asked um the instructor can i can i try bass instead and so they gave me a gibson gnl there was no teacher though so i i got handed the only bass that was in the building and i went off and i you know <laughs> sat there for hours going okay oh, like this and then a few weeks later i actually joined my cousin's band and i could oh. barely play but i sort of jumped in and that that's the thing that served me in my career I immediately joined bands I could barely play I was terrible for like a long time <laughs> but I was out playing and I was so stubborn I was like I'm gonna learn this song and I, I remember I would only be able to use two fingers and it was super funny because bass is big like for people yeah. who don't know or play when it's so much bigger than a guitar it's like a, yeah. it's, it's a large neck so when you're not used to it and you're getting your your fingers around it it's very funny so so yeah, it started late for me, but uh -huh. as soon as I jumped in, I was completely obsessed and I was like joining bands, like bam, bam, <laughs> let me join. And they're like, oh my God, just let her join. <laughs> as we spoke earlier, uh, you know, from uh, what I gauge, you've, you've been catering to a plethora of musical styles, uh, all the way from pop to R&B, soul, rock and roll and hair metal. Yeah. So that's, that's quite a lot, right? So you, you've worked with Dee Schneider, you worked with David Coverdale. Jordan Fisher and many more. Mm -hmm. How is it that you're able to maintain authenticity in terms of sound and go about the process of delivering quality within a very short time frame that's put forth to you in terms of in the context of performance? Yeah, well, I think for starters, as a musician, like often people tend to categorize themselves like, uh, you know, they'll say they're a jazz musician or a rock yeah. musician yeah. or for me, um, I, I also know my boundaries. So it's like, I would never say, okay, I'm like a, an experienced jazz player. But for most of the music genres, yeah. what I'm doing, especially as a hired gun, my job is to play for the song. That is right. it. So it's like, especially if you're playing in the likes of Whitesnake or you're playing Twisted Sister songs with, with T or the pop stuff or R&B rap, whatever it is. Yeah. So my, my process very much is like I get sent the music, I listen, listen and listen and listen before I touch a bass to understand exactly where everything sits and feels, the sound, because I don't think of, oh, this is a pop gig, this is an R&B gig. I think this is a bass line and this is where the bass line belongs in the song. 
And I really always want to honor the song. So it's it, it's not really like I think about the genre um, mm-hmm. because I've played so many, even with like the Riverdance shows and theater shows and playing with or- orchestral music. It's it's all bass to me. And my love of bass is what's mm-hmm. I mean, in the forefront. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's a process. But it's yeah, I, I like I like the fact that I've been able to play so many different genres because you will often get put in a box. Yeah. Oh, you're the rock chick. It's like, well, actually, <laughs> over my career, I've done quite a lot. But the thing is, performance wise, the best music to perform is with a rock band, obviously. <laughs> yeah. That kind of like uh, brings me to a follow up question. What What is your muse that impels you to be the musician you are? That's a good question. Um, I don't think it's a specific muse. What I find about performing, believe it or not, I'm quite introverted um, uh-huh. myself me so what i love about stage and performing is you're very present you're not Uh thinking about anything else so the actual act of performing and being part of a group of musicians it it sort of just takes you to another level it's very hard to explain unless you do it unless you are a musician who's performing it's like art it's like any form of art when you're in flow as they say so for me like you know we all lead lead these busy hectic lives voice in your head everything's always going when i'm on stage that's it I'm like in the song. So I guess that's kind of my muse. And and considering that you've played with musicians from different uh, cultural diversities and uh, communities, uh, could we discuss a little bit about temperaments of these musicians from your uh, personal experiences? I love that you're using that, like temperaments. Yeah, it's quite <laughs> funny. So it immediately makes me think about is, you know, you get certain... Certain people in the music industry across yeah. the years saying like, oh, there's going to be a girl in the band. It's going to bring a different dynamic. In my experience, because I'm always, you know, I end up being band mom. I'm very calm. I'm very into like health on the road, all that. Yeah, yeah. It's mostly like dudes that bring the drama. <laughs> Actually, it's always dudes that bring the drama. But I've been very lucky to tour with an amazing array of like what I just call band brothers so you know it's complicated touring for long periods of time is 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 hard because you know everybody's life is different some people have kids wife at home you know they have to you have to find this balance it's a very unnatural thing to do to like leave your life for two Uh three four five six months at a time so you have to understand that people are going to ebb and flow and, and that's part of the skill of touring. It's understanding how to give people space, to stay out of people's space, to know when to take your space. You're living on a tour bus together. Like it's crazy. <laughs> You're living in top. But yeah, for the most part, um, really professional players will, will understand that flow. But yeah, but like it's always dudes that are more, more complex than women. <laughs> But don't you think you've reached a stage in your career where you're able to dictate and decide for yourself in terms of a lot of these aspects, right? In terms of, uh, you did mention about like playing certain parts on certain songs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So don't you think you have that, I mean, given that you're, you're an experienced musician right now, do you think you have that ability to dictate at this point in time? You and mean decide to like, for yourself? Like to play your own parts. For uh-huh. Yes. It depends on the gig. Like this farewell tour that I just did with Whitesnake. Yeah. There is no way that I would make up parts on iconic yeah. songs. Yeah. Those Obviously, are classics. Yeah. It comes with my own flair. But to me, like, and I had to sit down and listen to a lot of genres of, of, of Whitesnake, a lot of different chapters. Correct. Because farewell tour. So David wanted to do a lot of different, like obviously the hits. And yeah. to me, I sit there and decide, well, who do I want to honor the most? Because there's been quite a few bass players. I know them all. Yeah. They all play very differently. And I thought Neil Murray is Whitesnake. So I'm going to listen to Neil Murray's bass lines and I'm going to honor him as close as possible, but obviously with my own flair. Sure. So it, it is that thing. It's like it's a flair of me playing, but honoring. So, but if it's a, you know, I've often done like pop gigs or R&B gigs where there's a general bass line or groove, but obviously you're, you can do your own thing. But again, back to my point earlier, it is my job to play for the song. So that's actually something that ends up making musicians lose their gigs sometimes is overplaying on a song that shouldn't be overplayed, especially as a bass player. You are the foundation. Mm-hmm. You are the foundation. You and the drums are, that's your job. So if you start going off doing your own thing, it's jeopardizing your job. 
do you have a practice regime that you follow on a regular basis at this point uh, honestly at this point in my career no um, and okay. let's just be completely honest because what's usually happening is you get a call about a gig be it wise or whoever you're, you're doing and that's it for that couple, however long you have like it depends yeah. on the situation so i've yeah. had calls like can you fill in for someone tomorrow yeah. for the next day and it's just panic mode or you're getting sent files of songs and you have like you know four or six weeks whatever yeah. um at that point, my practice routine is like, it's a process of first listening, listen, 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 listen. If I have time, then starting to write it out in a flow. If I know the, the set list, because what I want to do is know, sometimes you're not able to do this with bands, but if they have a rough idea of how the set list will flow, I want it so ingrained in me that I'm listening to it as a set. Mm -hmm. So I'll do a lot of that first, then notes. Um, and then as far as like in between tours, at this point, it's mostly just keeping my fingers semi-active. So there's no specific routine. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of stretching. It's also outside of playing the actual bass, yoga, yeah. looking yeah. after your health, because you're, you're always yeah. getting ready to like, live on the road for months at a time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it might be sort of an unfair question. What is the best thing about the, the bass guitar as an instrument? Is it the sound of it? Or is it the feel of it? Or is it what it can do? I think the feel of it for me as a player and for the audience, because yeah. you can literally, you can feel it. It's a very guttural instinct. I'm naturally drawn to that low end feel mids and highs. Don't like process the same in my ear. I love the feel of bass, mm -hmm. obviously, sound, but it can literally shake the ground. <laughs> so you know, that's my favorite thing in like sound checks, yeah. especially in bigger arenas when you're, when you're sound checking your bass and you stand out, on the runways and you're like yeah. wow my things can actually shake this building <laughs> exactly so it's very foundational it's a very yeah it's a very guttural instrument which i love about it uh we did speak about this uh, in a couple of previous occasions uh being a live performer is just one single dimension of your life you're also an activist and you host a vegan lifestyle show how cool is that could you elaborate a little bit about all, all of these other initiatives you're involved with yeah so like that's music is is one factor of me which i i love and obviously have had a, a really blessed career through the past 10 years but my my main passion like i spoke to you earlier has always been uh -huh. um is that activism side is like animals the environment people human health like just equality okay. all of that good stuff so i was trying to find ways over the years to really like bridge my passions and my very good friend who's derek from sepultura for your listeners who know sepultura the same. yeah of course yeah also a lifelong veggie and vegan so we've been friends for years and we were both on a layover in um in ireland a couple of years ago just before the pandemic mm -hmm. and we were sharing this idea that because we're always trying to find ways of how do you in a fun way like <laughs> show people how easy it is to you know be plant-based or at least semi-plant-based how easy it is to have a positive impact on the planet so I had this idea for a show and then Derek started showing me his idea and I was like they're really similar let's just join forces because it's more fun to like do it together with friends. So yeah, we filmed um, just before COVID happened for about a year before that. Derek was on tour with Sepultura. Mm -hmm. um, I was out with, I think I was still with Steven Adler at the time and different groups. And so we basically just looked at our schedules and we're like, well, let's try and film a couple of episodes. So we ended up filming almost seven episodes around the Obviously. world um, of different topics. So it's it's a really fun show because it's um, it's not just about food and plant-based food. That's like the easy part because we both do that anyway. But we cover like ocean conservation. We cover like the electrific electrification of vehicles. Like what what are the possible answers? You know, questioning everything though. Like with, with experts in that field, lots of celebrities all over it. And yeah, we're just editing at the moment and we're, we're you know, next step is try and get it out so hopefully maybe india will be the preview for it exactly just... we'd we'd love to because it sounds very profound yeah. you know and it's really fun you know? it's we we're both very adamant that delivering this message because sometimes activists yeah. and, and in any whatever it is you're speaking up for can be quite yeah. militant about things and that's never the approach so for derek and i we've been doing this our whole lives and we wanted to show a how easy it is because if we can do it traveling yeah. all over the world non-stop Everyone can at least try to do it. <laughs> but yeah, you never know. Maybe India will be our preview. That'd yeah, we could, we could have an exclusive premiere and I'd be happy to host you all here. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. 
I'm sure that there has been this phase of evolution and uh, and a whole gamut of learning that you've experienced through your music. In what ways does your personal journey parallel the gratifications that you must seek from the audiences from the fact of a performance? I'm sure the process is quite exciting and it has resonances of what we were talking earlier about. So what is the relationship between the personal process of discovery, form and structure of a play uh in terms of music and the audience and ultimately it's the audience that cult- like completely completes the entire process. So could you describe that at all? Yeah, it's <sighs> it's it's almost an indescribable thing but it, uh-huh. it it is it's back to that thing of like yeah. it's the only time when i think about it in my life other than when i'm doing say yoga or something that i really truly enjoy that takes my head out of like the chaos of life is that performing because you want to be there the uh-huh. audience wants to be there so that that's a great yeah. foundation thing it's like everyone in the room wants to be there which is actually a rare thing in life when you think yeah. about it you know, it's jobs or whatever everyone is excited so it creates this natural energy that's really profound and everybody who has differing opinions across whatever it is in life it doesn't matter for that 90 minutes so that's something that i really love about it because and again is that like the activist in me it's i believe that people forget that they have more in common than they don't so touring across the world and all these different cultures and all meeting all these people from different walks of life who we all think differently it doesn't matter music brings everybody together and yeah. it's like for the 90 minutes we forget all the other shit that we fight about which is <laughs> stupid when you look at it and water it down and it's this the audience just it's it's such a bizarre feeling because it's not ego but for me anyway maybe because I'm a bass player maybe it's different for lead guitarists and singers <laughs> <laughs> we always joke about this it's it's just this uh it's just very magical you know but at the same time what's really interesting is when you come off tour and when you're not on tour you have to be very careful because if you put all of your worth and self in that and being that performer being out there in front of audiences and then you don't enjoy your life without it you have to be really really careful about that something i've worked on hard over the years because you can have quite a hard crash come down from tour of like what's it all about now that i'm not on stage you know so it's yeah i mean it's kind of a, a weird answer to your question but it's a very deep question so that's kind of what came to mind <laughs> <laughs> well we did speak uh, or rather you did mention a lot about uh, spiritual techniques like yoga etc so in terms of in terms of this you know your your set of spiritual techniques uh, beyond the context of performance which is obviously a process of flow and surrender to something larger than yourself mm-hmm. right so could you elaborate on that yeah i mean as far as and it's funny i'm speaking to the the motherland of yoga <laughs> <laughs> you know it's funny when i first moved to la i didn't do yoga and i thought it was ridiculous because it was just like competitive over here and it was more about who had the cuter outfit and it was ridiculous and i was like i don't like this it was really fake but what it has done for me over the years because it's something you could obviously bring everywhere it's not like i don't want to look for a gym i don't i'm not that into fitness it was just something to take your head out of chaos for 10 15 minutes a half an hour um so yeah it's that like having having something to ground you essentially and for me for me that was definitely um what yoga ended up being even though i fought it for a long time because my first experience with yoga was los angeles and as you can imagine it's yeah. not what yoga actually is supposed to be or about um so it's funny it's just like you have to find things over the years that you can take to that are techniques to to bring you back to reality to ground you especially before going on stage to you know you're going on these festivals there's over 100,000 people there your brain is like da 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 am i going to do everything right is it going to go right is my gear going to work <laughs> let me take like 10 minutes to to do something for myself so yeah i don't know if that answers your question but you just got me in a yoga headspace <laughs> it kind of uh, reminded me of this conversation i had with uh, doyle bramhall uh, mm-hmm. he he did practice yoga when he when he come to india uh, he learned the entire art of yoga and uh, he wanted to sort of create something similar in la 
mm-hmm. at a certain point you know in terms of uh, med- in creating that entire environment in terms of meditation centers and things like that so yeah like he's been he's been doing a lot of that like maybe you could hit him up if you're looking maybe at that's lo- awesome. yeah, like fine it's funny because finding and i don't mean to judge any of the like yoga places everyone obviously means well but it yeah. is funny like anything when it gets watered down and it becomes more like a business because right. my friend like my friends um, that live in um in missouri you know my, they're an indian family and her dad when mm-hmm. he talks about yoga uh it's very different obviously it's about breath work it's right. a, so to get out of that like california la competitive space where it's more about like who can do the biggest handstands or headstands and yeah. whatever and it's the cutest outfit and because for me i don't really have like I even hate saying like people say, oh, you're a yogi. I'm like, I'm not. I don't even know what I'm doing half the time, but I know it feels good for me and my body. And I just bring this little practice with me. And then I can kind of go back to it in my head when I'm on stage. Right. And that trying and it's a it's a lifelong journey. Like I life of me have yet been able to quote unquote meditate the way that you're supposed to or whatever that means. But it also teaches you that that's different for everybody. So it's not, I can't sit still and like clear my mind. But when I'm in a yoga flow, my mind is clear, for instance. Right. So, but yeah. Interestingly, the place where I am, at, I am in right now, we have one of the finest yoga centers uh, called Isha Yoga, which is being run by Sadhguru. I don't know if you've heard of him. Of course, I love Sadhguru. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Sadhguru has created such a beautiful environment in terms of. Uh, you know uh we there's there's a shiva temple there along with a meditation center and they have a lot of interesting programs on uh mind engineering and things like that a lot of fancy stuff going on there but if you happen to if you happen to come down to india please do visit coimbatore coimbatore has got a lot of these meditation centers i would uh, probably never leave and go yeah. back to the temple so that's amazing whereabouts are you uh, come again whereabouts in india are you based I am currently based in Coimbatore which is my native. However, I work out of Bangalore. The so mm-hmm. Bangalore is is more of the metropolitan city and Coimbatore is definitely a developing city. Yeah. Right. It's more of an more of an industrialist uh uh you know space. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So uh how I mean you've you've always appeared from from what it seems like you've always a- appeared as a very flamboyant personality on stage or be it, be it anywhere you know in any public forum uh, how important is it for one to groom themselves in the best possible attire before presenting themselves in front of an audience it's it's funny because i'm flamboyant on stage but i'm the opposite in real i'm very chatty obviously that's yeah, kind yeah. of like, you know part of being irish for a talkative nation Yeah. but i'm very introverted but stage is it's also it's all, almost like an alter ego but as far as like presentation and that uh-huh. my style is not something i really thought about it's just how i have always expressed yeah. myself with big yeah. hair and to make my own stage clothes because i just don't i like to have my own thing but i think it's really important as a performer to entertain because obviously again it depends on the genre you're not going to go to like an acoustic singer songwriter and want the bass player to be jumping all over the place maybe you are but as far as my career and my genre and the bands I've been in the audience are there for a show if you stand there in the background and you're quite boring like they're paying for a show and if you're not enjoying it and that's not to say like you know musicians who stay a little bit more grounded on stage or it's wrong but for me it's just always how I express because again it comes back to bass I'm not I didn't practice performing it's how I physically react to playing bass because mm-hmm. bass in these songs is about hits it's about you know dynamics how I naturally play I yeah. literally put my body into it so it's it's not something that I was like oh let me perform it's mm-hmm. just how it unfolded <laughs> and then on top of that obviously I have big hair so it looks like it looks <laughs> It looks crazier than it is in my head which is funny when I see from the back I'm like oh my god I look like an alien jumping around the face. <laughs> but but uh, when you are in professional setups like when you're performing with White Snake for example do they have like a certain dress code that they follow does does that happen? No, it's not. I've never had a band tell me how to dress. They know okay. who you are. They've seen you okay. play. So okay. like 
for TV gigs and things like that, yes. And I there, that's right. things I've left gigs over before when people have tried to change my image based on, you know, oh, yeah. we're on TV and every, everyone has to wear, you yeah. know, this yellow dress. I'm like, <laughs> have you see, like, obviously if you didn't look into this. So I yeah. never want to have to change myself. So yeah. luckily enough, as your career grows, you know, people know exactly who you are. In fact, most fans have been like, you do you as much as you want to do you. So obviously you're not going to go out in white snake and, you know, just your yoga gear or something, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's rock and roll. So you want to, you want to present as well. But yeah, lucky for me, that's kind of my natural style anyway. But yeah, I've never had anyone other than TV gigs try to dress me and I left the gig immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. What has been the greatest obstacle to the realization in terms of your internal vision you have a vision in terms of a, a musical idea which gets molded into a composition is it technology or is it the people or pressure from any sort of external source that might limit a musician from doing so could you throw some light on that what do you mean like as far as performance <clears throat> yeah so so what what are some of the hindrances that prevent an artist to get to a certain milestone uh, right. he or she could be at. Right? So what are, what are some of these factors that sort of curtail the entire process is what, what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think for starters, self-doubt. Uh, all the artists can speak to this. Like crippling self-doubt is a thing. Like, you know, that, that's the, the sort of something that can trip you up on the physical aspects of it where you're like, I don't know if I can do this. You know, I've had many gigs over the years where I first listened to the music. I'm like, oh, shit, like yeah. maybe that's a little too outside of my skill set or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so there's definitely that, which I think any artist from any category of art can speak to your own internal self-doubt. Um, so kind of getting over that and realizing that, like, if someone called you for a gig or whatever your art is, they obviously know you're capable. So that's like one thing to get over. And then just as well, the way the world is set up, it's hard to be an artist. It's very, very hard to make a living off being a musician yeah. um, or any artist, again, uh, because the world is designed to be more, obviously, corporate and capitalistic. So you have to fight a lot of social judgment, like the when are you going to get a real job thing? Mm -hmm. um, also, like I say this to especially young musicians or any musician, really, there's also nothing wrong with being a musician and having an income from something else until you figure out if it's going to be like people do this whole like oh shit I have to have a, a side job it's like well that's okay if it allows you to do your art until hopefully then you get a break in making your art your own because there's like a lot of social and mental aspects that you have to come over and then really just again back to that whole like self-grounding of what do I want? What is my purpose in life? And I want to follow that. So you have to block out all that noise. And even for me, like as a young girl, the first the first thing that happened with me was like when I realized what was on the table, it was animals. I'm like, I know the feeling inside. I don't want to do that. So I'm not going to do that. The same when I started playing music. I was like, I want to do this. I and mean, everyone's like, you got to do this. You got to go to this school. You got to go to this college. I was like, nope, I'm going to go play bass. <laughs> but again, it's down to that listening and trying to it's hard. It's really hard. And I've, you know, swayed on and off it over the years, but just sitting with yourself and being like, what do I want? Let's not let everybody else around me influence this. And yeah, I'm trying to, it, it's, it's definitely not the faint hearted again, but yeah, there's the social aspect of it, of, you know, what the world expects you to do at certain milestones in your life. Sure. Um, so you have to draw inspiration from, from yourself and people who are supportive. And again, back to that point of, you should just, really 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 important who you surround yourself by uh how do you sort of respond to the changing scenario the the changing nature in terms of the structure the form and approaches in music do you in some way perhaps despair the increase in the commercialization uh, that probably might diminish the integrity from a very traditional sense because music has been evolving throughout so what is your take towards something like that? Just on like how commercial mu music has become. Yes. Well, it's, it's a funny one because again, like after doing so many genres yeah, and I've done like super pop gigs where it's completely like manufactured, you get the tracks 
from the management and there's literally no base. It's like it's a sub, some someone's put a sub on, there's no real electric base on it, it's side chained. It's like so you, in those moments you're like okay will I be more traditional or will I stick on a bunch of pedals and for the most part what it comes down to is the band the live band like you go in at the end of the day it doesn't matter if it's like what people quote unquote super manufactured music if it's catchy if it yeah. makes people feel good if the band is enjoying themselves playing it there's no point in judging a genre you know but uh, as far as my career today I've been really lucky with like a lot of classic rock and roll music like all the studio sessions I've done have, have allowed creativity in them right back to the stuff I did with Maynard and Pussifer that was really experimental. So mm -hmm. it was like using lots of toys and tricks yeah. and making noise, being creative. So that still exists. But yeah, you do gigs every now and then where you're, and there are gigs that I get called about and I just turn them down or pass them along because I listen, I understand what it's going to be live because yeah, there's a lot of very short-lived um, like pop, say pop country gigs that that come up that are you know they're demoing a new artist and it's only going to be six weeks you're like should I put all my time into this music I don't really have any desire to play they're going to throw a band together no one's really going to get to know each other and that's the kind of gig like when you're cutting your teeth and you're getting your new in music you should do but I've already done it so I do try to listen first and be like do I really like this music is there any part to me that's like I don't want to play this I don't want to play this but it's interesting because you know people still want rock and roll people still yeah. love you know prog metal people still listen to obviously like Deep Purple Pink Floyd Zeppelin all that that will never die thank god for those <laughs> genres and bands but now we do live in this like just it's like a machine literally of all this yeah. very similar music but at the end of the day the original legends will always live on and I believe people always go back to that and when you, especially after just doing a tour of like the hits of Whitesnake, you see it. Same with D, like everyone sings, we're not going to take it still. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's interesting. It's interesting how the music industry goes. And there is so much of that manufactured sort of less sold. But at the same time, if there's a market for it, it makes people feel good. Who am I to judge it? You know? Very true. Uh, up, up to what? extent do you consciously seek to cultivate originality or to do something different just for the heck of it <laughs> you mean on stage or off stage on stage um i think it's just it, for me it just comes as a package because again i'm not seeking to be like i'm never going like i always think of like still of the night for instance with white snake my favorite song to play with them. It's one of my favorite bass lines I've ever had to learn because there's so much happening. It's like a story from beginning <laughs> exactly. to end. Exactly, yeah. It's so beautiful. And there's a lot of bass players who've played it over the years and in White State and other that don't actually play the line. So yeah. in that instance, I'm like, I want to play this. Like, read it like it's beautiful poetry on bass. This is such a stunning part. So I'm never going to, in that instance, be like, oh, let me put extra things here because it's already gorgeous. But if there's, you know, if there's something fun to be had in a, in a bridge between songs or we do endings or intros together, of course, like put a little bit of your own flair. But I don't like seek to be like, let me fill a space, because I think I think that comes down a lot to being a bass player. It's more the job of, you know, the guitar player or, you know, your top keys to to be a bit more flashy. For me, I love, I, was, I wasn't a guitar player before I was a bass player. I'm just a bass player. I've always just been a bass player. So I'm not ever sort of seeking like, oh, there's a space I can fill in or there's, you know, actually in bands that I'm in always laugh at me. They're like, you should go up front more. I'm like, I'm so happy being a bass player. <laughs> so it just depends. Again, my job is very specific. It's not the same as when I was in original bands. When I was younger in Ireland, I was writing and making these parts and using more pedals and you know the bass is very prominent because they were my original bands but in my career with these types of bands i'm honoring the music so uh in in terms of your career uh like you mentioned you've 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 been like doing it for several decades now and you've toured and performed in different landscapes and different geographical envi environments so have you felt a correlation when you look back between these en environments you've worked in? 
You mean how you perform or like when you're there? Yes, some kind of common strands in terms of uh, the audience or in terms of the uh, culture. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's the fun thing. It, lucky for me with the types of artists mm -hmm. I've been performing with across the board, no matter where you are, yeah. these hit. No matter what language people speak, that's what's so fascinating. You're in countries all the time where people don't speak any English and they sing every word <laughs> in English. It's it's really beautiful because it speaks to music, right? right? It's just like it's a universal language. So that that's the common thread. And what I've always been really, really fascinated is when you go to like especially South America, places mm -hmm. like that, rock is so I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about those audiences because we've I've played with D and I've played with a couple of other like rock and roll gigs and, and sort of legendary songs and places where um de developing countries where people don't have a lot of money to spare but they love music so much they'll save up and get a ticket and come and it's like an event of the year and you can feel that and that's profound that's like something spectacular because what we often take for granted in developed countries like oh you can go to a concert every weekend and so you do feel a difference it's and it's not to you know look down on audiences one place or another but it it is different and it's it's really impressive. And it, again, it's just back to that music. Like music brings people together. Music is a universal language. When people are there, they want to be there. No one forced them to be there. I hope not. And it, it's it's just extra special when you know that people, have, especially in an economy like now, like everyone across the world with inflation, with all these things we're having to battle coming out of this bizarre two years, music is the thing people are going back to. But we have to fight for our industry so much because it got squashed the most. Yeah. live performance and big audiences so it's yeah it's just fascinating that you can go anywhere in the world and if a hit was a hit <laughs> people are seeing it like on every continent it's it's phenomenal if you had to indulge in a little bit of futurology and uh predict what direction music would be heading 20 years down the line what would you have to say about that i would hope that it goes back to what it always was a grassroots okay. rock and roll live music because got it it's interesting that we're going into this you know it's more and more digital ai there's pros and cons the meta all that that can that can exist and be interesting but we can't allow ourselves to lose what it is that live music is that live performers are because also as a studio musician having recorded many times in studios where they bring in a live band to play yeah. Then they replace you with a digital track so they don't have to pay royalties. So all these things happen, but then nobody wants that live. People want a band. So I hope that it always goes back to rock and roll. I think it will. I think people want need that because it's raw and it's like the anthems of our time. Obviously, as generations move forward, it, it varies, but it's kind of our job to pass it on to the next generation of like, what, this is what music was before we had to think about what's oh, too long for radio. Like, you know, Pink Floyd weren't thinking about that when they're doing like <laughs> a three minute intro or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, it's balanced, but I think it should and will always go back to live, live rock and roll and, and even things like orchestras and, you know, going, seeing real musicians play. You can't, you can't have, any other it'll never feel the same if you do it you know in the meta or with ai let's I don't hope want to, let's hope for I the best to, yeah <laughs> i don't want to sit with like vr goggles on and pretend i'm at a concert i want to be at a concert there's place yeah. for both of those but you know yeah <laughs> uh you've you've had a very long relation with uh, exotic gu guitars right uh, which is being spearheaded by toshio hariba you've been very closely identified with the brand and what is so unique and special about this entire relation well i was actually with exotic for a couple of years at the beginning and toshi yeah. and the guys um yeah. built me a beautiful base it was my first um yeah. basically my first little custom and it was fabulous and i've always been of the i prefer to be with a smaller boutique brand who's directly mm -hmm. with their with their clientele because it, again it becomes like a family thing if you're just in like a bigger yeah. commercial like it's kind of bought out by a bigger you know conglomerate or whatever it feels different there's no real artist relation but i've actually been with sadowski guitars that's who uh, these are my sadowskis which is roger okay. today okay so uh, all right 
Yeah, I still have my exotic that I play, and it's my my B and C, it's with my B and C rig because it just feels beautiful. They they did a really good job on it. There's a young builder that built it for me, Mitch, and it was my first. It was kind of like a one of my the first big thing in the in the instrument world that happened to me when I first came here. But I my my dream was always to play Sadao's keys because Roger, for anyone who knows guitars and basses and builders, Roger Sadowski is like the the king of Pinnacle. the builders and yeah. so world renowned boutique builder custom bases and he's built for some of the greatest bass players in the world and i met roger at a base um at a base hang that used to happen in la bass player live that's on any longer and you know we connected and it was like wow and i never be able to play this guy because he's a very <laughs> high level builder you don't often see in like the rock and metal world we became instant friends and we stayed in touch. And then he would start to like, let me play them when I was on the East coast. And then it's just like, I mean, you play these things and you're like, there is no better instrument in the world. He's such a meticulous builder and they're light, the light, some of the lightest bases. So when you're touring, okay. it makes a huge difference if your guitar is like nine or 10 pounds versus 12 or 13 when you're jumping around stage. So, so I've had really good relationships um, through exotic, which I still have and use. Um, but Roger Sudowski is definitely like my base family and you know we got it these are my my children and then my <laughs> so been, how many of them do you lucky. have at this point you know I'm it's funny I'm not that bad but like I'm not a gear hoarder because okay. I'm, I'm a minimalist and I travel a lot and I don't like instruments not being used so if I'm on oh. the road the three or four that I don't really use I usually give to my friends to use and play because I prefer them to be played so in total yeah. Between Ireland and here, I probably I say I probably only have 14 or 15 bases. But for for a lot of people, that's not much because I, yeah. I don't want gear just for the sake of having it. I get offered gear every week. People want to send me, <laughs> but if I can't use it and represent for the company, right. I don't want to take it just because they're giving it for free. I don't like that. Um, I want to use it and I want to have a genuine relationship with the company. So I prefer to have a smaller amount of gear that I use, love and proud to tag and proud to use as opposed to, oh, let me just have free stuff. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm quite minimal with my gear. I'm with, you know, Sadowski's Ampeg. I have this amazing pedal company that built me a uh, custom pedal, iron pedal, iron pedal boards, and then mm -hmm. like dark gas electronics and Dunlop. And that's it. I don't, I have to politely decline a lot of gear offers because I tell them honestly, like I'm, I'm yeah. not going to do for you what you need me to do as an artist. So I'd rather, you know, respectfully decline and, and say that I can't do that for you. So it's a lot of, a lot of people just want free gear. I, I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> if, if correct me if I'm wrong, but you were also associated with Warwick at some point. right? Yeah, I was with Warwick Am for, for yeah. quite some yeah. time, because, but, and they're amazing. And Warwick, we had the, Warwick would bring, all the bass players in the world over to yeah. Germany. We did like four years in a row. It was the most amazing music hang ever in Mark Neukirch in Germany. They used to bring us all over, everyone from every genre, you name it, like Trujillo, East Clar, like every bass player you can ever imagine from every band in the world was pretty much there. There's hundreds of us. It was hilarious. But Warwick um, have also got Framus. So they were they were doing the amp thing for a little while, but then they started to put their focus into Framus guitars more. And I wasn't playing their basses; I was using their amps. So we just, you know, they weren't going to go on with the amp thing enough. So I was with Galleen Kruger naturally for for a little while when I because I I played them just when I was younger in Ireland, and they're a wonderful company, and I've had some amazing amps. But when White Snake was kicking off, it was really that moment of gear wise to honor the genre. I need to have like you know, these SVT heads, these old classic eight by 10 rigs. Mm, so yeah. it was the perfect moment to, to go full on with, with Ampeg. And they're, they're amazing. And it's, it's real rock and roll, you know, sound, old heads and old cabs. So, so yeah, I was with, with, I've been with a couple of amazing companies and I have great relationships with them all. And they, you know, for different gigs and different times in my career, it's, it's been perfect fits. Great. So now we will be moving to an interesting segment of our interview. Uh, it's it's called Turn It Up, and this is brought to you by Hashtag Magazine. Ah. And uh, the cool part about this segment is you don't have to think too much. You can oh, be God. spontaneous with your answers. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's going to be more of a fun round. Okay. 
So first question for you, Tanya. Uh, what is that one song that always makes you cry? Oh, God, right now, still in the night, because I still love, <laughs> I'm so attached to it. Yeah, that's a <laughs> Honestly, lovely song. Yeah, Jeff Buckley, Grace, every time. Got it. <laughs> On the contrary, what is your favorite guilty pleasure song? Oh, God. Um, Carry On My Wayward Son, Kansas. Kansas, okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Not guilty. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me let me test your your white snake IQ. Uh, oh God! You know, shooting sure. out like a like a little bit of trivia. Name five <laughs> five white snake songs which has the word love in it. Oh no! The guys used to do this on the road, and I'm terrible <laughs> at. It. You know who's also terrible at? It? David Coverdale. I can't think of them. <laughs> oh God. Uh, okay, deeper the love. Guilty of love. Uh, I was going to say, don't break my heart again. Um, God, ain't no love in the heart of the city. Uh, oh, my God. Give me all your love. Um, I can think of a fifth one. Something love. <laughs> love. Love ain't no stranger. Love ain't no stranger. What a great song. Yeah. Just, just to preface, David's bad at this, too. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the, the 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 musical masterpieces that he's put out is just I don't know, it's it's so timeless. And I yeah. can go on listening to White Snake songs like a hundred times and I still don't get bored of it. <laughs> so great. Uh what are the five must haves for you while touring? Oh wow. Snacks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you know you're traveling. What kind of snack? What kind of snack? Would you be a little more so specific? Me, always, I tend to think like nuts and seeds, dried fruits. Um, Got it. Some like healthy green, you know, some of those powders I can bring on the road just because you never know yeah. when you're going to get delayed or whatnot. Um, for me, I always bring, I love essential oils. So I always bring like lavender and stuff because it helps me with, with jet lag. Um, obviously your passport. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have these little um, like hand accessories. Bending. Yeah, just for yeah. while you're traveling, because some show days you can't get to your gear enough before yeah. you're you're landing and you're going on stage. Yeah. The stuff to stretch. I always have a yoga mat and a foam roller in my wardrobe case and moisturizer because different climates. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot your instrument. Well, they're there anyway. <laughs> They go with the gear. I'm just, I was trying to think of a little bit more like quirky things. Got it. Like day got to day. <laughs> People yeah. are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and a book, a book, always a book. Got it. Yeah. Uh, if you had to put together an all-star rock and roll band, who would uh, be in it? Oh, my God. This is going to be a, either a tiny band, but I don't want to insult people, or a giant band. Man, I don't even know where to start with that one. Because alone, when I start thinking of drummers, I've like this list in my head. Uh -huh. But I would definitely, uh, just, cause, just because it's current, Tommy Aldridge. I mean, yeah. he's incredible. I, in fact, quite a lot of my White Snake band, I would have Mike Michele Lupe on keys because he's mm -hmm. phenomenal. He can sing like a beast. Yeah. Um, so many of my friends are amazing guitar players. So I could honestly be here all day, like Alex Skolnick and even, yeah. you know, Joel and the guys I just, toured with Devin Townsend um, I would take Maynard on vocals because I love how <laughs> jump genres yeah. um, you know but then I've like Dee Snyder and David and oh god it's almost impossible <laughs> I, I'm afraid to start listing people because then I'm going to start getting texts off friends that are like you never mentioned me <laughs> yeah. yeah there's there's so many but I would like as guitar players go, there's so many different genres, like obviously the Steve Vise, but my favorite guitar player of all time is Lindsey Buckingham from Fleetwood oh, wow. Mac. People are always surprised by it because he's not necessarily flashy, but yeah. that's what I love. He can, he can solo using like two notes and make, bring a tear to your eye. So yeah, it would be a very bizarre band. <laughs> well, uh, if, if I'm sure it'll strike an emotion for someone like you. So yeah, sounds yeah. good. <laughs> What is your favorite cuisine? Oh, um, wow. That's a tough one because food is my favorite cuisine. I'm such a massive foodie. I actually love Indian food. It's one of my favorites. Okay. Um, I love Indian Thai food. But I, yeah, I love just like what you consider whole food plant-based. Yeah. 
yeah, creating, yeah. but I love spice and I love actually one of my favorites would be Indian. <laughs> Got it. I have one last question for you, which is a custom in all of my interviewers. And I ask my guests this very question. Down in the distant horizon, what would you want to be remembered as? Someone who made a difference while they were here. Yeah. Someone who Very made a difference and talk. made, yeah, just I, because all of the, when you strip away all of the music, all of the performing, it's wonderful to have, but I want to be remembered for at least trying to make the place, the planet a better place and opening, you know, people's minds and hearts a little more. So I think that that is a bigger purpose than anything performance. Quite a, quite a lovely take. <laughs> it's a lovely question <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much for that so before we conclude this interview will additionally air on two major radio stations in india which is going to be big fm shillong and big fm azal which are in the northeastern part of india awesome. and and this interview is also going to be part of my audio podcast series stalwarts of music with aditya veera which will be on Apple Podcasts and soon to be out on other platforms like Spotify, Google Podcasts, etc. And it'll also be on YouTube. So as soon as this episode is out, I will be sure to send, send across the link and you can feel free to share it with your fans. Absolutely. Absolutely. For sure, man. So before we conclude, I'd love for you to sort of uh, give a concluding note for a lot of aspiring musicians and activists and a lot of people who who could possibly be motivated by uh, what you have to say. Yeah, I mean, as far as the music side of it, I often tell musicians, aspiring musicians who want to do it professionally or not, like to, to not put all the pressure on being a professional full time musician, because mm -hmm. that will essentially maybe stress you if you're if you're pushing too far in a genre. The best thing you can do is get out and play, play with different bands, play with that's how, you know, you're going to cut your teeth, as they say. Yeah. Um, just playing with like a diversity of styles, a diversity of people and enjoying music for, for just playing it, because it is a very, very tough industry. And if yeah. you're trying too hard, it will kind of implode on itself. Um, so not forgetting why you're doing it, essentially, and just getting out and playing and not like shutting down gigs because you don't think you're a blues player or a metal player, like play all the music because then you'll sort of find your own voice within it. And then outside of music, I think back to our whole conversation about just sort of looking inward and figuring out what your purpose is. I know this is something that's sort of almost watered down at this stage because it's all over social media and there's all these like life coaches and gurus. But honestly, because I, I've always known since I was a little girl, like what my path is um, in the activist space. So and I think we're we're forced into like lives that we don't necessarily want because we're supposed to follow a certain format. So really spending some time, no matter what age you are, and figuring out, am I happy if you take everything away? Right. And like, what is it I really want to do? And because the whole purpose of life really is to, to serve others. Right. To have some. Yeah. thing that you give back and that doesn't mean you have to go full time into it but just it will give you a bigger sense of anything in the world right? like helping others or being a part of the movement and finding out what that is that really makes you like what, what makes your your heart like really <laughs> shine when you think about it you know so it's 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 two different things and, and you know music can be that or it could be as simple as helping volunteering somewhere or you know, a yoga practicer, but I think, you know, we get one shot at this, we get one life. So we don't want to be at the other end and be like, Oh my God, I wish I spent more time on, on TikTok or Instagram. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. And read more books and stop watching mainstream media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's something that all of us need, need to sort of imbibe. So as we continue to celebrate a dozen marvelous musical pieces, your showmanship that you've displayed in terms of your abilities, uh, in terms of playing this very instrument, uh, it sort of displays a very rich and intense life that all of us sort of await to watch. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you so much for uh, making this happen. It's been an absolute privilege and I hope to stay in touch with you and have you in India very soon. Um, God, I, I love the idea of going out to Sagoro and, and, and going yeah. to the yoga okay. Place. oh my god yes i would love to because india unfortunately is somewhere i've not yet been which i hate <laughs> i'd love to love to go but thank you for having me and to all your listeners because it's and it was a really fun interview you actually Thanks. think you're cool. 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for that. And and last, last but not the least, do convey my regards uh, to Mr. Coverdale uh, from one one of the one of the biggest fans from India. <laughs> He's an absolute sweetheart and a fantastic human and absolutely. And I'm sure if he ever me, he'll give you the biggest hug you've ever imagined. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for everything, Tanya. It's been a, it's been a privilege. You too, man. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.